By the early 1900s, after the horrors of World War I, the old premillennial and postmillennial sects or ideological differences within evangelical Protestantism began to change, began to modernize, if you will, to an extent. One group would become known as the fundamentalist, looking back to the past, their anchors in their Christian foundation, and those looking to the future referred to as the modernists. Now, the fundamentalists looked at the many ways that man had relied upon his own mental capacity through the advancements of technology, for example, and their abandonment of God and the Bible and their faith. To the fundamentalists, science became the Bible of the modernists. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species added fuel to the arguments of the New Age modernist movement itself. According to historian Matthew Sutton, modernists opposed and questioned the loyalty of the fundamentalists and portrayed them as rabble-rousers, as old-fashioned, and it was pessimistic faith and lack of patriotism undermined the nation during World War I and the years following. As Sutton noted, American Protestantism was facing a crisis. It was a crisis of identity and ideology. Fundamentalists looked at a return to the Bible and a reconnection to their Christian past. Modernists looked to the future, a future that relied much more on the ability of man than on the Bible. And in the aftermath of World War I, this Protestant crisis, a true American crisis, would culminate in an epic ideological battle, which would be waged in the backwater town of Dayton, Tennessee, in 1925. The theory of evolution began to work its way into American classrooms starting in the late 1800s. By the 1920s, several states had passed laws banning the teaching of evolution, which countered the school instruction that centered on creation and the Bible. The Tennessee state legislature had passed the Butler Act, which forbade the teaching of human evolution in public schools that accepted state funding. It did not prohibit it from private institutions. John Scopes, a part-time science teacher, violated the Butler Act and became the focal point in one of the century's most ideological dramas. It could be argued that the ideology behind that, which would become known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, was as weighted as the oral arguments heard this week by the United States Supreme Court concerning the issue of abortion in the country. On the side of the prosecution was noted orator and politician William James Bryant. Bryan had run unsuccessfully for the presidency and was a devout Christian, one that incorporated scripture into his speeches and policymaking. Defending Scopes was Clarence Darrow, an agnostic lawyer. A case turned the town of Dayton literally into a circus, attracting journalists from across the country, as well as preachers and ministers and commoners who flocked to see and hear both Bryan and Darrow. The case devolved from the guilt of Scopes to the importance of creation versus evolution the Bible versus science. The media, not unlike the media today, had a heyday with the fundamentalist argument and Bible defense of William Jennings Bryan. As today, the people cheered Bryan as he uh, was reported in many of the local newspapers in Tennessee. Yet the reports and the reporters from New York and Chicago wrote very different articles and reported very differently. Darrow took the opportunity to directly defend, or, or question rather, Bryant on the seventh day of the trial on the issue of biblical importance and fact. This point of question had been misrepresented since the trial. Relying only on newspaper accounts, one would conclude that Darrow and the modernists soundly trounced Bryant and the fundamentalist cause. Reading the actual transcripts, however, that what was really stated proves a very different point. Even modern films and documentaries err on adding weight to the Darrow's questioning of Bryant. Clarence Darrow turned the case by announcing his client guilty, which then prevented Bryant from questioning him. The jury found Scopes guilty of violating the Butler Act, and he was charged simply with a $100 fine. In the end, it was not really a teacher on trial, but rather Protestant Christianity and the crisis it faced in the 1920s. As the country and the world catapulted into the technological and mechanized advancements of the 20th century, they left behind the foundational core of who they were. The Scopes trial highlighted the growing divide amongst fundamentalist ideology that remained anchored to their Christian roots and the modernist Christian view that relied more heavily on science and the advancement of science for the betterment of all.